Hey, good afternoon. This is John Billingsley, the Director of Social Studies. And it's my pleasure in collaboration with the Office of Music and Dance and our Baltimore Zone Creative Alliance to welcome you to Homefront, World Culture in Context, part of what we hope is a monthly series of performances. Before we get started, I want to kind of direct your attention to one logistical feature. In the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you'll notice a Q&A um, feature. You can use that to ask questions throughout the performance. And at the end, if we have time, we'll go through and we'll answer those questions for you. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Josh Kahn, the director, performance director at the Creative Alliance Museum. Josh. Good afternoon, students. I hope everybody's doing well. This is Josh Kahn coming to you live from Baltimore with a wonderful program of music of Central Asia. In a few moments, we will be joined by Badi Darju Odnar from a yurt in the Republic of Tuva. Have you ever heard of Tuva before? I bet you haven't. Truthfully, not many people have. It's tiny, but significant. Let's learn where Tuva is. So I'm gonna break out my trusty globe for this moment. Let's see, can you see this? All right, so here we are in Baltimore, uh, right across on the uh, Eastern seaboard of the United States. We are gonna have to travel 6,000 miles to get to Tuva. So we're gonna go across the Atlantic, over Europe, across Russia. Let's see if you can see that. Right where my X is, this tiny little country under the X where Russia and Mongolia and kind of close to the border of China connect, that is Tuva. So now you have that in your head. Um, the, uh, the artist you're about to meet, Badi Darju, sings in a style probably unlike anything you've heard before. We call this style throat singing. Um, and if you listen closely, you'll hear multiple sounds at the same time. Badi Darju will sing in a deep rumble that comes from his chest. Uh, there'll be words that come from the back of his mouth and even high pitched whistles that seem to come right from the top of his nose. And often he will make these three different sounds at the same exact time. So give yourself a second, take a moment and see if you can even make two sounds at the same time. Maybe try thinking of your most favorite song and try humming it and try singing the words at the same time. You'll see that it seems impossible, right? Well, the Tuvan people over a long time have trained themselves how to sing this way and have taught each other how to sing this way and have taught each other how to do it within family and community. We will be joining Body with his friend Sean in a yurt. It, a yurt is a traditional home structure of the Tuvan people. A yurt is round and it can easily, easily be put up or taken down along the grasslands of Tuva. It's kind of like how the Native American peoples here in this country would put up and take down a teepee as they were traveling around the plains. We are thrilled that we can bring this program to you. Now let's welcome Badi Darju Odnar from Tuva. Welcome to Tuvan Music with Body Dorju Ondar from the Alash Ensemble. Uh, my name is Sean Quirk. I'm the manager of Alash, and I'll be here today helping Body as he plays uh, some Tuvan music for us uh, right here inside of a traditional Tuvan yurt. So, uh, Body uh, is going to start with a piece on this beautiful Tuvan instrument, horsehead fiddle, called Egil.
Respected instrument of the Tuvan people. It's one of our favorites. Uh, Tuvan people have played this instrument for a very long time, uh, long back into history. It's called Igil, and uh, it's made from a single piece of larch wood. It's got skin on the face of it, and the strings of the bow and the strings of the uh, instrument itself are made of horse hair, and the instrument has a horse's head carved on the top of it because it's a uh, instrument that is dedicated, that is very strongly associated with horses, which is very important, right? In Tuba, uh, horses are uh, a big important part of the culture. Yeah, there's some people who are in those tall jungle jungle, was a was a jungle service, was a jungle, who was a tall jungle jungle. So there's lots of legends as well about this instrument, the eagle. Lots of stories and legends in Tuba about where it comes from. <laughs> so yeah, nowadays uh, sometimes we don't use horse hair, we use uh, nylon fishing line as well uh, for the strings of the instrument because it's a little uh, better for temperature and weather. So, um, so now, uh, Body, what are you going to show us? So so speaking of horses, this is the instrument that uh, Hu Mei Ji, uh, that's a person who performs Hu Mei, <coughs> Tuvan throat singing, uh, they use this instrument like a horse that they ride on, and uh, it's made like the agil out of wood with skin on the front, but also on the back, unlike the agil. And this instrument is a plucked instrument with three strings uh, that Tuvan people use to accompany themselves a lot when they're performing uh, the various uh, styles of Tuvan who may. So the name of this instrument is the Dosh Balur. <laughs> base of a lot of Tuvan music, what the body's playing right now is called Dembil Day. It's also got a horse's head on the top and even some jingles on the top simulating the sound of uh, the bit and bridle, the metal parts of horse tackle that jingle when we travel on a horse. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
So uh, I was singing for you uh, songs, uh, words about my homeland, where I'm from, uh, the village of Ime, and songs about different places there, songs of, of joy and praise uh, about my homeland. You know, speaking of uh, your homeland, right, the place you were born, old uh, old old so uh, this thing uh, right next to us here is called Kavai in Tuvan, and it's a, it's a baby cradle uh, for babies. It's a traditional Tuvan thing uh, that you would wrap the baby up uh, in warm blankets and put him in here and uh, you can rock the baby on this. Um, people could also carry it. It could be a way to carry babies as well. And you'll notice we're we're inside a traditional Tuvan yurt here, and you can see that uh, the walls are made of felt, the floor is made of felt, the ceiling is made of felt, and then it has these uh, wooden poles. These are called ana. Uh, these are made from uh, willow. And then over here, too, we've got some, these are called edere, for uh, softening skin. So uh, I think, you know, you would agree that uh, for Tuva animals, maumagan, uh, are a very important part of life and everything that's around us comes from living with animals. So. Mm-hmm. Um, um, the yurt is, is really full of symbolism uh, for Tuvan people and it has lots of uh, customs. Uh, for instance, if you're a guest, you're going to come in and you're going to walk over to this side. This is the side for the guests and the, the owners are going to live over here and the most respected people are going to sit here uh, where we are, which is a place called Dur uh, in Tuvan. And so this is where you would put your most honored uh, guests inside of the yurt. And also, you've got these beautiful wooden uh, chests. <laughs> yeah, it's Tuvan furniture. It's called Aptara. And, uh, you know, Tuvans are nomads. And this whole thing is built so you can take it down and put it back up in another place so you can move around from place to place. So you don't have a lot of furniture, but uh, what you do is really, really sturdy and really useful, just like these beautiful uh, Aptara. So we'd like to thank you greatly for your interest in our music and our culture here in the Republic of Tuva. And uh, today we'd just like to wish everybody, of course, uh, to be happy, to be healthy, and to be safe. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon. Well, hello again. Um, I hope you enjoyed hearing Badi Darju. I think he's a, just an incredible musician. We'll be joining Badi again shortly, so um, we'll bring him back. But first, I want to introduce a very special guest. Uh, Shodake, the gentleman to my right, I think, 
on your screen probably the same way, but who knows. Um, Shodake is one of the great beatboxers of our time, and he lives right here in Baltimore. You might be familiar with beatboxing, perhaps more so than throat singing. Beatboxing is a form of vocal percussion involving the mimicking of drums or a drum machine. Beatboxing is connected to hip hop, often called the fifth element of hip hop. Great beatboxers have elevated the art form from simple mimicry to a high art, and Shodake is no exception. Um, although he and Badi Darju live over 6,000 miles apart, they have a collaborative relationship that transcends distance and culture. Let's welcome Shodake to learn more about beatboxing and tell us a bit about where he learned about throat singing. Um, first, um, I'm going to bring Shodake directly onto the screen and maybe he can give you a sample of um, his beatboxing tradition. All your Shodake. <laughs> How you doing? My name is Shoda K, professional beatboxer, vocal percussionist. And you might be wondering, how is he doing some of those sounds? How is he doing them all at the same time? Let me give you all a quick reference before I tell a little bit about my story. So think of the letter P, 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 as a bass drum. Think of the letter T, T. for a hi-hat, and then maybe think of the letter K, 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 for a rim shot of a snare drum. And most importantly, don't ever, ever, ever forget to breathe. So let's backtrack. Let's see. Let's match each sound to a different part of my story. So the bass drum, the letter P sound, goes all the way back to Penn State. Um, my freshman year, I was the only one on campus of Beaver campus of Penn State who could beatbox. Small campus, not a lot of people, not a lot of students. So it gave me an instant platform. And I began to practice it all the time. I was constantly refining my craft all the time, all the time, working, 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 just practicing, playing with friends, uh, other musicians. And then throughout Penn, Penn State, uh, my time there uh, showed me how I could develop my craft on my own terms because it wasn't something that I learned while I was at Penn State. I learned through the community of other students, musicians, and so forth. Now, let's see. I started a beatbox group called Larynx in 2002. Beatboxers, vocal percussionists, there were eight of us, six guys, two girls, and we had so much fun practicing together, performing together, rehearsing together. And they, one day during a session said to me, you ever heard of throat singing? And I said, no, what's that? And they played some for me and my life hasn't been the same ever since. Now, fast forward to, the letter T, hi-hat. I started playing music for the dance department at Towson University. I'm loving how these symbols and these uh, consonants are matching up to my story. But at Towson University, I started playing music for the dance department there as a musician for dance classes. So I would play for ballet, modern dance, everything. And that was how I was able to establish myself as a professional beatboxer. That was in 2006. So fast forward all the way to 2011, the letter K, <coughs> Rimshot K, I was introduced to Bobby Dorjuandar, Ayan Shirzik, 
and I know Sam and Sean Quirk of a lash. And I had my first opportunity to be introduced to who made players, the letter K. It's who made, by the way, is spelled K-H-O-O-M-E-I, who may, first time meeting professional to and who may singers. Now there, um, we played our first session at Towson University. We had a dance department studio to ourselves ourselves when no one else was around and they invited me to go to Tuba the next year in 2012 and it, my life has continued to change over and over again working with the Lash um, and the Tuba Cultural Center. Now I'm going to do a quick demonstration of how I've learned how to synthesize bits and pieces of Tuba and Hume into my beatboxing by way of working with the Lash, the Lash so closely for almost 10 years, believe it or not. So let's see what that sounds like within the context and form and structure of beatboxing. Hmm. <sighs> So I do that in the presence of a lash because that's my way of paying tribute to their culture, their traditions, and how it's impacted me. And when I perform that style, when a lash isn't around, I always make sure to pay tribute and acknowledge the source of that inspiration every single time because they are my teachers in that form. So with all that said, let's move a little bit forward into 2020. And uh, let's see how working with the Lash and bringing them back and forth between here, Baltimore, other parts of the world touring together has developed really powerful relationships with not just myself, but other musicians who are in the area. Some of the very best musicians I've ever had the opportunity to work with. Uh, Body Doors, you and I are working on a very special recording project and we have this one song that's been shared with the world and it's traveling all over the globe by way of the internet. It's called Traveler and it stars uh, other musical elements that you'll hear. So when you hear this, listen for keyboards, listen for bodies who may, his throat singing in overtone styles, listen for some rapping by Easy Jackson, some singing by Joy Scott and Jasmine Pope. And try to listen close for the vocal percussion parts. You'll hear me do a shaker. And you'll also hear me do some hi-hats. And if you want, feel free to practice your vocal percussion parts along with the song and this amazing sharing of Traveler featuring animation, original animation by students over at the Maryland Institute College of Art. Shout outs to them. So let's take a look at the acoustic version of Traveler and then the special video of that featuring Body Gurju and Dar and special guests. Thank you. Up here, uh... He's picked for the last song on the program, uh, a song that uh, he wrote uh, the, the melody for. And uh, the song was actually performed last year in Baltimore with a lot of our friends there with Show Decay and Joyce J. Scott and Wendell Patrick, Easy Jackson, Jasmine Pope, uh, really good friends in Baltimore that we've been working with for a long time. So the song, uh, Body, I believe it's called uh, Traveler in English, right? Yeah. I bought a bag and told my lady, I'm going to stay slow enough to run us. As a solemn moment, then I said, I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go 
Bunların dolayında çok lazım gördük bence. Ama size gelen borunu fazla geleni hele hadi bir üzgüldü çoğurladır olmuş. Hep çoğurlar, hep çoğurlar. Sen böyle başka yerden bir yerler gitmeye gelen de açtın o zaman o zaman. Ana botlar ıstın o zaman. Tamam. Yeah, the song's called Traveler, you know, and uh, it's it's uh, really about our lives, you know. And uh, you know, it's a song about people who are just on the road, traveling, nighttime, daytime, doesn't matter. And that's fitting for Tuvan life as nomadic people and fitting for our lives as a musical group. Never staying in one place for long, but moving around a lot. So we're going to finish up the program tonight with a song called Chormal, Traveler. <laughs> That was awesome. I love that video. Interestingly enough, children really love that video too. Aki, Sean, and Body. Um, a key, by the way, uh, is hello in Tuvan, so you can practice that. A key, it's spelled E I. A key, so your sound is working too. Okay, beautiful, okay. awesome. Man, thank you so much for being here today, um, all the way from Tuva. Are you at the Tuvan Cultural Center right now, by the way? Yes. Yeah. Ja, okay. 
Awesome, awesome. So, um, Body Dorjou, Sean Quirk. Man, I, I miss y'all, by the way. <laughs> yeah, we do, too. We miss your show. So, the overtone singing and then Traveler, right, that we heard you do, um, can you uh, share with us a little bit about the... Um, the style that we hear in the video of uh, Traveler, the, the, maybe reference one of the styles that we hear um, in the video. Tell us a little bit about the, uh, the, the technique itself and a little bit about how it's done and a little bit about the, the why, perhaps. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh all of them all the doctor on uh uh dinner that they would end up uh may sag carra uh on to the Pondola Hana all have their kit prana uh Taking <laughs> So in the song, uh, if you if you listen to the whole song, which we just listened to, you know, a portion of it there, uh, each different verse in the uh, features a, a different uh, of tube and throat singing. It's uh, you know you, you can think about it like a different uh, turning your voice into a different kind of instrument. Uh, who is like a middle range instrument. So that is like a high range instrument. And uh, when Body sings the words of the song, uh, which are in Tuvan, he's mostly using the low style of, of Kargara, which is, gives you that like rumbling voice. Um, but then for each different verse, uh, each different verse is focused on a different one of the different types, different one of the vocal instruments uh, that Tuvan people have, like who may and uh, Sagut. And, you know, these are techniques that uh, Tuvan people have been doing for a long time. And uh, it uses something called overtones, which is a feature of all music and, and all, um, but body and, and Tuvan musicians are masters of uh, using that feature of sound, which all sound has, and allowing it to change their voices into those different instruments that uh, we heard in the song. Awesome. Beautiful. By the way, um, so I know Tuva is in southern Siberia of the Russian Federation. So just now uh, when Body was speaking, uh, were we listening to the Russian language or were we listening to the Tuvan language just now? Yeah, it's a... Uh, yeah, tuba, tuba has its own language. It's the Tuvan language. Um, you know, it's uh, it's a part of the Russian Federation. It's a state in Russia, just like Maryland is a state in the United States. Uh, but the Tuvan people have their own unique culture and their own unique history and the unique language. So when Badi and I talk, uh, we're speaking in Tuvan because that's the comfortable language for both of us and Badi's native language. Okay, awesome. Just wanted to do a quick clarification there for our people at home. Um, yeah. So in the video, I remember seeing an image of a horse a few different times uh, throughout the animation. Um, for our listeners and our viewers at home, can you maybe talk a little bit about uh, the horse's presence, uh, perhaps in the video and how it transcends the animation um, and, and pays homage to the uh, the traditions and culture of of the horse's presence of the Tuvan experience. Can we talk a little bit about that? I mean, maybe um, 
if we have if, if there's an agil nearby you could show us the horse head of the agil and maybe uh you could reference that timeless uh agil story that agil origin story maybe i don't know yeah I'm <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, you know, in, in Tuvan, there's a saying, uh, which means, uh, you know, no, no horse life. And, uh, you know, you noticed uh, in the video, there's a lot of horses and uh, that's because, actually, Jodeke, that's a lot thanks to you, of course, uh, for familiarizing the students with uh, Tuvan culture, which is really cool that they picked up on the horse, which is very important for Tuvans because when you're a nomad, it means you move around from season to season. You saw body and myself in the yurt. That's the, the dwelling that you pick up and take down with you. And uh, when you're doing all this moving around, you know, the horse is, is really important to, to help you uh, in that seasonal movement. And, you know, furthermore, um, because of that importance in life, um, the horse is especially important. It's really important, uh, especially um, when you sing songs, you're always, if you're a man and you're, you're singing a song about, uh, you know, a, a woman that you really love, um, you're going to sing about your horse first. And two people always took really good care of their horses uh, because it was considered sort of a part of your spirit, you know, your, your, your best friend, your, your, you know, your really trusted companion. Um, and so if we, uh, uh, this uh, show was asking about the Egil and, uh, you know, we saw this in the video as well. I just kind of of the head here. This is the instrument that body played first in our video. And, uh, you know, it's very important. It's got this horse's head carved on. Um, you know, this com comes from uh, a legend. Uh, this instrument is really, really old, you know, this kind of instrument. And there's a lot of legends about it in tuba, but uh, the one that's really interesting, talked about a lot, is a legend of an orphan boy who. Uh, you know, he was very young, but he didn't have any parents, and so he was working as a horse herder for a rich landowner. And uh, one day he noticed that uh, one of his mares was having a baby horse. It was foaling, it's called. And uh, he ran over to where the mare was foaling, but it, it had gotten attacked by one. And he saved the, the, the baby horse, but the mother was killed. And he ends up with this little orphan baby that his boss says, you need to get rid of that. It's It's too much trouble to raise it and so he uh secretly he hid it from his boss he decided not to kill it and he raised it instead they grew up to be best friends and these horse races in tuba and the boss out of his jealousy the land owner man had the horse killed he sent his men and they chased it off of a high cliff um and the boy was really distraught by, by this um he, he he knew something bad had happened to his friend he couldn't find his horse and he was wandering around for a long time, and eventually uh, he, you know, passed out and had a dream or a vision where the spirit of the horse comes back and tells him to be calm and, and to, to cheer up because she's going to show him a way to how to, they can be together through music. And she tells him uh, where her body is, and she shows him how to make this instrument. She says, I want you to use my hair for the strings and my skin for the face of the instrument and carve my head on it. And when you play it, uh, then my spirit will come into the instrument and our spirits will be joined together for all time. Uh, so the, the boy went and he did this, he found the body, he made the instrument, he played the music, 
And you know, it was a very sad song at first, but soon enough it got really happy because he looked up and he noticed all these horses had gathered around him, uh, uh, including one newly born horse that looked just like his uh, old best friend. So he knew that the spirit of the horse had come back through the instrument. And uh, so when you saw a body playing that in the beginning there, when you see any Tuvan play it, um, it really highlights that really deep respect uh, that Tuvan people have for horses and the importance in the life. So it's all tied together through the, the way you live and the music you play, um, you know, and the way you feel about the world. It's, it's all kind of united in the idea of the human and the horse coming together through the instrument and through music. You know, the more I understand these origin stories, these narratives, uh, these mythologies, the more it, it inspires uh, how I frame working with you all uh, when we tour as a lash together. <clears throat> and I found in the uh, the last few tours that we've had, um, I w it gave me an opportunity to experiment with emulating the sound of a galloping horse as part of how I structure rhythms and beats and counts for the music that we do together. Like, for example, I might do this as a way of paying tribute to the horse's presence within the larger understanding of Tuvan culture. <laughs> That was fun. I enjoyed that. But um, nevertheless, <laughs> um, man, I miss playing with y'all. Um, yeah, I, I found interesting ways to, to improve and refine the music that I create with The Lash. Um, and it just, it's a perfect way to uh, have the music and the understanding of the history and the narratives of the culture combine and reinforce one another. It's, it's a really great way to learn and, and to do research by working with you all. Um, so with that said, you know, I got to talk about um, some of the beautiful uh, s visual scapes, landscapes that we saw in the, the video. And it, it, again, it reminds me of the, the land and the environment of Tuva. Um, I, I noticed that on the new Alash album, Mini Mana, uh, Body Dorju, you have a solo where you play the, I believe it's the Dosh Pelor, and just the dash floor and your voice. And the song is entitled, um, and in parentheses, it's entitled uh, Earth, I believe, if memory serves. And uh, it's just, I got to imagine that you're paying tribute to the, the visual landscape and the, the natural environments of Tuba that still exists. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's like you're singing nature, you know, uh, music, uh, is, you know, it's really connected with nature. Um, and when you start to listen to, you know, the different uh, ways of performing, um, you begin to hear the, the connection of nature, you know, all the, the sounds of the wind, the sounds of the water, you know, as you know, Shobike, like, you know, Vorbang Nadir is a sound, it's just like a warbling, bubbling kind of sound that, you know, this is a sound that comes from water, it reflects water. And um, so, you know, the earth is the, um, you know, the connection that's where all of us spring from, all of the nature and everything like that. Um, so it's really natural um, that you would have that uh, because people are living in nature and inspired, you know, reflecting the sounds of nature, imitating them, but also inspired uh, by those sounds. So you hear that all, um, you know, uh, anytime 
when a musician from Cuba, especially a really good one uh, like Body, uh, is is performing, you know, especially in the more traditional way, like on that solo. Well, for instance, when, uh, you know, uh, Badi was talking about the lower style that he likes to use a lot, which in Cuban is called Cargara, uh, even inside of that type of music, there's there's a mountain type and there's a, a you know, like a flat plains, a step type, you know, and they have different characteristics. So even, you know, whenever you look at the different kinds of uh, music, especially with the throat singing, the vocal music, um, you find different parts of nature. Like you mentioned, you know, Tuba has really fantastic, beautiful, and, and varied landscapes, and it's reflected in the music. Here's the Dosh Palur. Dosh Palur, Dosh Palur, Dosh Palur, Dosh Palur, Dosh Palur, Dosh Palur, So body's just, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. you can hear the different horse rhythms in the Dosh Palur, you know. Oh, yeah. Kind of yeah, horse yeah. Head. Uh, body was just showing us how he uses the instrument to create a horse to ride on, you know. It's like the horse that the rest of the music rides on. You know, um, I found myself thinking more and more about how those natural environments impact my work as a practitioner of the vocal arts and I've been going deeper and deeper into this concept that I refer to as breath art and beatboxing has a lot of industrial sounds that possesses um, sonic textures that make people think of the cityscapes or a, or a variety of different cityscapes <clears throat> but with breath art I found I've been able to emulate more natural environments like for example, I might do the sound of ocean waves or wind blowing. I was wondering um, if you could demonstrate one of the Who May styles that emulate a that emulates a natural element of a natural environment in Tuva. <clears throat> <laughs> That's called Borbang Nadir, and you know, Joe, this would probably be the point where we might ask the students what they think, what part of nature that comes from. So maybe you guys just think about that for a second. So do you, do you want to take a stab? You probably know what uh, what natural element that would represent. It's, uh, that's the water element, you know. Or bang nadir style, which you know, it's like the bubbling sound. And if you listen to body, you know, it's speeding up, slowing down, and constantly kind of bubbling and rippling, like the sound of, of water in a stream. Yeah, beautiful, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, um. Man, there's just so many more questions to, to ask. Uh, I can go on and on and on. 
Um, we've talked a lot about the natural landscapes. We've talked about uh, some of the relationships with um, different animal species that are within the Tuvan landscape and the Tuvan experience. Um, we saw you uh, talk a little bit about um, what we find within the, the natural uh, location of a yurt within a yurt. Um, but, you know, I'm super curious about uh, Kazil Tuva as well. Um, in, you know, it's, it's the only city in the area of Tuva. Um, can we hear you talk a little bit about uh, the, the going back and forth between the, the natural landscapes of the larger regions of Tuva, um, the natural landscapes, but some of the comparisons and contrasts and some of the benefits of being able to go back and forth between the city of Kazil to other parts of Tuva that have nothing to do with a, a cityscape. <laughs> So, yeah, you know, that's a really good thing to talk about, show, because, uh, you know, yeah, you know, a lot of people live in Kazil now. It's about one third, maybe, of the whole population of, of the Republic of Cuba. Um, and, you know, people of our generation, uh, you know, when they were young, uh, you know, Body was reminiscing about his school days, you know. Uh, all you want to do whenever it's um, holiday time is go on out to the country, out to grandma and grandpa's place, help them out with milking the cows and building the, uh, you know, animal pens and, uh, you know, moving the yurt and everything like that. Uh, so for Tuvan people, you know, even if you grow up in the city, traditionally that way of life is always right there and it's always close to you. Um, you know, now a lot of, you know, back then there wasn't internet and phones and stuff like that. And, you know, when we take our kids out there to the farm, to the, to the herding camp, you know, it can be boring for them because there's a lack of internet, you know, <laughs> and there's a lack of screens and stuff like that. But, you know, even so, I mean, uh, you know, our, our other colleagues and I, Ann and I and all, you know, uh, they've got places not too far from the city where they can go out and be with their animals, raise their animals, and, uh, you know, the kids have an opportunity as well to, um, you know, continue to have that interaction, which has always been a really important part of life here and one of the major determining, uh, you know, things about how the, uh, how the culture has become the way it is, you know? Awesome. Um, 
So let's see if I can wrap this up into one last uh, package of a question. So let's say, for example, you're leaving the winter camp, right? Um, like, say, for example, the one that I visited uh, last time I was there with Wendell Patrick, who you also heard on the Traveler video. Let's say you're leaving the winter camp. You're on your way back to Kazil. You stop over at the Tuvan Cultural Center where you are now so that you can make your way, pack your bags to fly out of Kazil and make your first tour stop right here in Baltimore at the Creative Alliance where I am right now, right? Um, and you're putting on a show, the first show of your tour um, here at the Creative Alliance, um, hopefully with me. Um, okay. And let's say you have some other guest musicians, uh, maybe some of the other guests who we heard on the Traveler video. Uh, to bring it all home for all of us here, can you talk a little bit about uh, the relationship that's been building in ways that none of us could have ever expected right here in Baltimore? Um, we've had so many dynamic collaborations over the years. Um, so can we talk a little bit about that, your connection to uh, me and then beyond me, uh, your relationship to Joy Scott, Wendell Patrick, Jasmine Pope, you know, just how Baltimore and Tuva have cultivated this amazing ongoing experiment of spectacular uh, creativity and um, musicianship. starting from the times when, um, you know, uh, Alash, when we were first meeting you, Joe Decay, uh, almost 10 years ago now, um, starting from those collaborations, you know, uh, musician never wants to tread water, you know, you never want to just stay on one thing and kind of do that. And, um, you know, from, from our end, it's been a, a search uh, for um, you know, creative uh, ways to continue to uh, express the music and, um, you know, find new combinations, you know, starting with working together with you show and, and touring around with you doing different shows, you know, many in Baltimore, but also of course in a lot of other places, um, you know, uh, across the United States really and here in Tuva too as well. Um, it's been an adventure and then, uh, you know, having people like Joyce and Wendell and Jasmine and Easy, you know, uh, coming together, working together with everybody at the Wind Up Space and the Creative Alliance and, and all of these moments over the years, uh, having this project where you've got all these high level of professional musicians, 
even if we haven't played together in a long time, everybody just kind of comes in, everybody understands each other, and everybody kind of drops into, uh, you know, a, a common groove. And uh, we're really grateful for that. We're really happy that that's uh, an opportunity that we've had, you know, to, to really uh, celebrate the special relationship uh, that's been forged by, by, by you, by body, by a uh, you know, by all of our other friends in Baltimore, our musician friends, our friends who helped to program all these events, you know, people like Josh who are supporting our unique collaboration. We, we're, we're really, uh, we're, we're happy and we're really thankful uh, that we've been able to do it and, uh, you know, we hope to keep on doing it into the future. Beautiful. Same here, man. Same here. Um, I think that about... <laughs> wraps up our time together. I want to uh, welcome Josh Kahn back. Hi, everybody. You can put your mask on for me? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to come back in. So um, we know there's some questions, and we're going to pull those up so we can... Uh, okay. So first off, I want people to know that um, that it's 12 hours ahead in Tuva. So the um, uh, we want to thank uh, Body and Sean for being up at 3 a.m. with us. I, I only I know there's some other questions I'm having time pulling it all up for some reason, but uh, I know there's one one question I do want to ask, and that's uh, and I think this was sent in by an audience earlier is how long does it take to learn to be a throat singer, body? Like how how at what point did you say uh, if I had heard you that you you got it? I know you started at a very early age. <laughs> Yeah, you know, to answer the question of how long it takes to, to become a, you know, good at it or to become competent at it, it's, uh, it all depends on uh, your dedication, it depends on your heart, you know, um, uh, how it goes for you, you know, how dedicated you are to it. Um, you know, uh, Body, of course, started when he was really little, but we've known a lot of non tuning people uh, who have picked up the art, uh, you know, some of whom who have become quite good. Uh, over a relatively short period of time, you know, we we uh, have a friend Elliot, you know, who was able to go from really zero to uh, quite competent uh, performance, you know, raw but competent over the period of just about six or seven months because he really, you know, some people just kind of have a knack for it and they throw themselves into it, and other people, you know, sometimes they can they can hack away at it for a long time and it never really seems to happen. So. Um, you know, just on your drive, it depends on your heart and, uh, you know, how much you're willing to, um, you know, dedicate yourself to, uh, to learning it. Well, I think that dedication has paid off. We appreciate you being here, Body and Sean, at 3 a.m. in Tuva. Um, go get some sleep. Uh, we want to thank, of course, everybody at Baltimore County Public Schools who facilitated this program to happen. Uh, to Shodake, um, to everybody who's behind the scenes here, thank you so much. Have a good day. Stay safe. We'll see you soon. Oh, there's one more thing. <laughs> you thought I was done. That uh, there's. Please go on to the link that's popped up for. Um, we're asking you for a quick. Uh, fill out a quick survey. It'll take you two minutes. Give us that information. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you. So, <laughs> uh,